Our first speaker today is Professor Lynn Abbott from the University of Western Australia. Lynn's research areas include soil health related to agriculture, horticulture and viticulture, soil biology, indicators of soil quality, soil fertility, plant microbe symbiosis, especially a muscular mycorrhizal fungi, mite sign rehabilitation and soil management, including organic ag agricultural practices. Professor Lynn Abbott. Thank you, Chris. And I'd like to thank the organisers for bringing me all the way from Western Australia to talk to you. And as such, since I've come from the other side of Australia, I don't come here to pretend to tell you much about your own um, soil management, but I'm going to talk in principles. So I'll introduce the session for today, thinking about soil biology, soil health in a general way and in relation to principles. And this is where I've come to after teaching soil biology for many years in a context where nobody ever was really particularly interested in it. So I've spent a lot of time wondering what you do with soil biology in a context where it often gets left behind. Now, I know that's not the case here because there's been an enormous amount of interest in soil health and soil biology in your groups. But on the whole, it's, it's not a straightforward thing to deal with. It, 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 there are, the recipes are not straightforward and it really depends a lot on you knowing what you're doing with your own soils. So that's the context that I'm going to talk to you today. We've got a handout here that you can pick up as you go through. It's a, a page, two pages, which summarises four websites which we have which relate to soil health. Some of you might have seen some of them, but I think that it is a resource that you can choose to pick up from the front bench as you go out. So we actually coined this term soil biological fertility some time ago because I spent a lot of time thinking soil fertility. And when you review the literature on soil fertility, you don't always come up with soil biology. It's really, it's hard to separate the components. So we set about quite some years ago in separating components of soil fertility biological, physical and chemical. Now I know today we think like that, but some time ago it wasn't thought in that way. So with an emphasis on soil biological fertility, what can we do? So the overview for today, and there's a very big question around this, can we sustain food production? You know, this is a big ask for soil biology, all these little organisms in the soil doing this big, big task. But at the end of the day, we are asking the organisms in the soil to do something quite big. But we're also asking the managers of the soil to manipulate this so that it works. So my few overview uh, points, soil fertility is not just about nutrients and fertilisers. And, and when, you look at fertilise, when you look at soil fertility, it's often what's the chemical fertility. And then I've summarised this into 10 principles. These 10 principles I'm going to run through and they might seem to you to be very simplistic and what's the point of that? But in fact, because soils are all different and your land practices and what you grow and what you sell, all these things are different, you actually have to work it out for yourself, but within a framework. And this is what I'm going to try and do today. Obviously, there are options for enhancing soil biological fertility and the rest of the day there are many examples of work in this area. So the specifics are coming later but mainly I'm going to be talking about these principles. Whoops, I'm going the wrong way. So my approach, well through my teaching in soil biology in the University of Western Australia I did a lot of workshops with farmers. I, I actually listened more than I spoke I think. I learnt so much more listening to the farmers. And eventually we set up a website and it's called soilhealth.com. So if you put soil health into Google, it'll probably come up as a website that, this, that relates to this. And the information's on this, on this sheet you can pick up. We also put together, Dan Murphy and I, we edited a book on soil biological fertility. It was published by Clua. And this has got a lot of reviews. And so if you're interested in the technical side, you can go and investigate that. We've investigated a lot on what are the indicators of soil health and I know that a lot of the impl impl implementation of the sort of indicator work is being done here so I'm not going to focus on that. But we've recently set up a website for, so for schools so that children can monitor their soil and this is a website that is almost ready to go out and 
Although it's for schools, the recipes and the, the ideas of how you can monitor your soil could be useful to you. So it's, it's a, a nice link that you even might have with your local school. So what have we got here? We've got some knowledge of soil biology. So pretty much people know about this stuff now. And we've got a series of land management options. And then we've got you. And you have to deal with that, what you do on a daily basis. And there's a dollar sign here and how that all works. So your land is different from someone else's. Your farm is different from someone else's. Your soils are different and your options are different. So the, the, what you do depends on your own circumstances. There are recipes, but there are also principles that can be applied across this. So the recipes might not work for you, but some aspects of them might. Now in Western Australia, you might have heard in Western Australia we've got sand. Actually, we have some half decent soils in Western Australia too, but there's a good thing about having sand because you start with actually the basic. We can add things to sand to improve it. So we even add clay to soil. You mightn't be familiar with that concept, but there are a lot of non-wetting soils in Western Australia and people add clay to the soil to improve its quality. Actually, they didn't do it to improve soil biology. They did it to stop non-wetting. This was maybe 15 or 20 years ago. But the interesting thing is now that the farmers who were doing that many years ago to prevent non-wetting are realising there are other benefits of adding the clay. The clay is already on their farm. They dig a hole and they bring it up. It's very expensive to do it, but it's a one-off and it often makes a big impact on the quality of the soil. But in Western Australia, our soil's pretty low in nutrients. We're starting from a low base. We've put a lot of nutrients on, fertilised, the soils have been fertilised extensively over the years. But we start with a low base and poor soils. Now, I think that's a recipe for learning. When you've got a problem, you're going to learn more. If you've got an easy situation, you're not going to learn as much. So these challenges are actually probably a good thing. So you all know there's a lot of things in the soil, many different kinds of organisms, fungi, bacteria, the animals, and they all work together. So if you push one of them, some, that'll affect some other. So how can you manage this whole thing? So you can't know all the bits. You can't know the whole thing, but you can manage it holistically. And that's what you have to do. So you can manage phosphate fertiliser by applying it and knowing how much to add and looking at it in relation to all the different crops and even cultivars, all of this. You can manage that by focusing. To manage what's going on in the living part of soil, you can't manage all the little bits, okay? You can put rhizobium on and you can deal with the pathogens a little. But it is a holistic system and so it requires a different level of thinking to bring it all together. And if you just focus on one area, you'll miss another or you'll nudge another and you'll tip it out of balance. So it is a tricky space. The, the food chain here, the organisms or um, interact closely with one another and when you put something into the soil like organic matter or when you till the soil you disturb this system and disturbance is not necessarily a negative thing but you rearrange it and you rearrange the interactions between the organisms so how do you control all of that now People say there's a lot of organisms in soil, but because there's so much surface area in soil, all the surfaces of soil are not covered by organisms. A lot of it is actually free of organisms. So soil is, is a, a house, a home for the organisms, and they interact within little spaces within it. It's not a mass of organisms as we sometimes like to think. There's a lot there, but they're not covering every surface. Thanks. Now the plants you grow actually help to create the habitat of the organism. So the first thing is you've got the soil, the soil, whatever soil type you've got, but growing plants is a major part of controlling soil biology because the carbon that comes from those plants is what drives the system. Now, I'm going to run through these principles. So there are 10 of them. They're on the website, the Soil Health website, right at the end of the book that's on the front page of that website. So. These, this is very simplistic, but I can't think of any other way of dealing with this complex system than to relate in principle for then within the own, your own context to apply these principles. And the way you apply it might be different. 
So absolutely the simplest thing is that the organisms are mostly in the surface. So protecting soil, the surface from erosion is absolutely basic. But loss of soil is a major factor in, in our um, soil management and we can't often see it disappearing. So keeping it there, keeping cover on the soil is absolutely essential. So the plants and the soil together are creating this biological system. Now in Western Australia, where we do have sandy soils, you can think about this concept. How do you keep carbon in the soil? If you've got a sandy soil, there's nowhere for the carbon or the organisms to be protected. And so they, the carbon disappears, even from even a good crop in a sandy soil, there'll be nothing left in a very short time. And the reason is that the organisms have broken it down. So putting, I'll talk a bit about this in a minute, but putting organic matter into the system is, is, it just comes out again in our sandy soils. How do you actually keep it there is the question that we want to look at. Second, that the, the uh, second principle is that organic matter is necessary for nutrient cycling and organic matter soil, soil aggregation. Now this aggregation of the soil I want to emphasise is so important because historically we used to think there was this thing called recalcitrant organic matter. The current thinking is there's no real such thing as that unless you look at wood chips or something like that. So most agricultural plant matter will degrade very quickly. So you need to aggregate the soil in order to protect the organic matter. That's an important principle. So the third principle, maximum soil biological diversity depends on the diversity of the organic matter and the habitats. Now, Biodiversity is a big word and we all think it's, biodiversity is very important. Now, bio, the soil is the most biodiverse part of the universe. Here we've got all these organisms contributing. But the principle here is the more diverse the habitat, the more diverse the organisms. So this means if you're only growing wheat and you're only putting wheat into the system, that wheat organic matter is not very diverse and the organisms associated will be less diverse. Still very diverse because it's soil, but less diverse. So the more variety of organic matter goes into the soil, so in more different plants you grow, the greater the heterogeneity of the soil and the greater the diversity. So this is a principle for plants and animals when you have, I think I'll use the pointer here. So in relation to a low nutrient system or a low carbon system and a high carbon system and in then with dis disturbance if you don't disturb the soil or if you do disturb it more and that might be tillage but it doesn't mean excessive tillage as you increase the heterogeneity of the, env the environment you'll increase the um, biological diversity so in a low nutrient system that's not disturbed actually you'll have your maximum diversity, biological diversity. And up here, where a system is in a higher nutrient, higher carbon system with high disturbance, you'll also have maximum biological diversity. Now, this is a complex equation, all right? Not simple. It doesn't mean that the diversity across the system is all the same. It means the maximum you, diversity you can get in any system will depend on how much you disturb it and what you start with. So you can't say soil has to have a certain level of diversity of organisms. It depends on the conditions. So if it's low in nutrients and low in disturbance, it can have its maximum level of diversity. Now these are complex questions, so I'm throwing some of this in just to add the complexity to the principles. But we don't understand the answers to some of these complex issues. And I think when we say a soil should have a certain amount of diversity or a certain amount of carbon, then we're running in the wrong direction. What's the maximum diversity and the maximum carbon for that particular soil? And so that comes down to, down to your soil type, your management practices. So. This, diver this diversity will be the highest for this system and up here for a high nutrient system when you've got more, diver more disturbance you'll have a higher level of diversity. Complex questions. Now, 
The next principle you're very familiar with, nitrogen fixing bacteria, we want to maximise nit biological fix nitrogen fixation. There's no question that we should be using this facility. This is here, nature's given it to us. If we're not using legumes in the system somehow, then we're not maximising biological fertility. Now this is a very general principle about nutrients, that the nutrients are released from the organic matter. So if you take the organic matter away, you're not returning to the soil, the nitrogen and the phosphorus, the sulphur, the zinc, all those things back into the soil. So simple principle that I have for soil biology is to keep the organic matter where it grew. Now that isn't always possible, but the principle is keep it on the land. There might be other uses for it, but perhaps the soil biology needs it more than other uses. Now you might be familiar with mycorrhizal fungi, and this is something I've worked on for many years. These are organisms that colonise the most agricultural plant, most plant species, but certainly most agricultural plant species. They can make more efficient use of phosphate fertiliser. There's no doubt they can. They can help in exploring the soil and taking up phosphorus and putting them into roots. So if you have a farming system where you don't take note of this, then you're not using some of the biological fertility in the soil. I'm not saying that they're always present in all roots at a maximum level at all times, but I'm saying if over a period of a, you know, several years within whatever farming system you have, you're not trying to maximise these fungi in the system, there's one component of fertility that's not being attended to, and that's efficiency of phosphorus use. It relates to fertiliser use as well, the two go hand in hand. Soil amendments, now you're probably already familiar with all the things you can add to soil, but certainly we're doing some work in biochar, as is happening over here. We're doing some work in adding biosolids to soil, clay, lime, all these things amend the soil and they all inter, inter act with this biology and the particular uh, practice that is used will relate to your land and management system. Now we're up to eight. This is the eighth principle. This time it's about disease control and one of the best ways to control disease is through management um, and obviously you can't know what all the organisms that are going to cause disease in your plants are doing, but there's a lot of knowledge here and the management systems are really well tuned to minimising disease. And some of that is through biological control. And that is the system itself can control the, its own disease if it's managed the right way. So this is another important principle. So next, there's this dollar. And productive systems based on soil biological fertility can be profitable. People have shown this. There are systems which, are, which maximise the use of the organisms in the soil that make money. And if you are doing that already, that's fantastic. But there are people who, who do have agricultural systems that are productive. I think the common view is if you focus in this area, you won't make any money, you'll have less sustainable systems. But let's say it can be profitable, it's just finding the way. And the 10th principle is that this takes a lot of time. It's not like adding fertiliser and you get a result the next, in the, in the same crop or in the subsequent crop with, with carryover. This takes time and if time is not factored into the management, then it, you won't be able to use the, the fertility from biological processes, it's no doubt. Because if you're impatient, you won't let it settle into its own rhythm and carry forward this contribution that the biology can make. So without taking time into account, then you can't really manage for biological fertility. So you have to be patient. So here's just quickly some options. So you know what the options are for building. You've got to feed the bugs. This is what it's all about. Whatever way and whatever system that you've got, you can do. But we also need to make more efficient use of fertiliser. You know, it's not just about management for the organisms, it's managing the fertiliser in the system and I want to emphasise that. It's also about managing amendments and you're familiar with that. And people also in some cases like to add microbes and I'll have a few words to say about that. So let's build the soil carbon. Now the trouble is when you 
put carbon into soil, it just disappears again. And this is a seesaw. It happens, it's very hard to retain it in the soil because the organisms love this stuff when you put it in the soil and it goes straight out again. So how do you keep it there? Well, I already mentioned aggregation and this is a way of protecting organic matter, but certainly it is a dilemma. As you put more carbon in the soil, you increase biological activity and more carbon leaves. So it's not just a simple question of keeping, of how we keep it in the soil. We would like to balance it, but we don't really want to balance it. We want to retain more. So it's one thing is you can easily lose carbon from soil. The next thing is you can balance it. And the third thing is how you keep more in. I think it's the most challenging question. So the amount you have in soil will depend on the soil conditions, your management practices. But when you add carbon to the soil, it will increase, then the organisms will break it down. You'll lose it as carbon dioxide here. But you want to retain more than you started with. And that's a challenge. So I open with this little thing that probably doesn't make sense to you. But to reduce the loss of soil carbon, you need to reduce microbial activity. And with soil biology, we always think of increasing soil biology. biology. So, but we need to actually control it as well if we're going to keep carbon in the system. Now, it's possible to add carbon to soil in various ways or management practices, but is there a limit to how much you can put in there and keep in there? And there are two ways of thinking about this. One is there's no limit. You can just keep adding it and you, you don't ever reach a maximum. But probably more likely is that there is a maximum level in each soil. So uh, eventually you're going to come to a plateau that you can't really increase the carbon anymore. This is the most likely. Now a lot of the models don't have this factored into them. A lot of the soil carbon models have an open-ended system, which is probably not practical. So let's go back to this other model I showed you earlier. It's a hypothesis here. But this time, along this axis is soil texture, and this axis is disturbance, so tillage or other disturbance. And I'm suggesting that here's the line here where you'll get most carbon sequestration. In a sandy soil, this is Western Australian sand, in a sandy soil with low disturbance, that's where we'll maximise the carbon. And that's probably not a really high level of carbon compared to a heavier soil, but low disturbance of a sand will maximise carbon. But as you increase the, the soil texture, as you get to a loamy soil, here, if you have no disturbance of that kind of soil, you won't have maximum carbon sequestration. It's predicted, I'm predicting, that you need some disturbance in the system. Now, when I say high disturbance, I don't mean ripping it up and tearing it apart, but some level of disturbance. Occasionally, not every day or every year, but some level of disturbance is necessary. Because remember these organisms that live in the soil need oxygen, they need organic matter to be incorporated, all these things help the fertility. So some level of disturbance without ripping it apart is what I mean here. Okay, so a sand that's not disturbed will retain its highest potential um, carbon sequestration. And this is why. Because when you've got low disturbance, you've got low microbial activity and slow breakdown of organic matter. So when you, when you disturb the soil at high disturbance, you expose the organic matter, it, microbial activity is very rapid and it breaks down quickly. So this is the reason that I'm predicting that for a sandy soil, low disturbance will have the highest um, carbon sequestration. Now if you go to, the, to a loamy soil, I'm predicting you need some disturbance of the soil, of the system, because when you disturb the system, you're disturbing the microbes, you're playing with that a whole network of organisms and how they're interacting with one another. And so some disturbance is required. And that's because of this. So at low dis in a heavier soil with absolutely no disturbance, it's harder to incorporate organic matter. OK, there'll be roots growing through, I don't think. But there'll be less incorporation. When you disturb it a little bit more, 
then it's incorporated, but it's also protected. When you disturb it a lot, you have a lot of microbial activity and it'll break down. So this is, you can't just say a particular soil will hold a particular amount of carbon because the microbial processes in the soil in relation to disturbance are all going to affect how much actually stays there and how much microbial activity is going on. Now this is an extreme and this is probably not um, the case to this extent that I'm showing, but in a, in a very heavy soil it will require more disturbance. So I don't mean high is an absolutely heavily disturbed situation, but a heavier soil will require more disturbance to retain more carbon. And this may not be a logical way of thinking, but based on the microbial activity, this is probably what is necessary. In a very heavy soil, it's harder to get the carbon into the soil in the first place and incorporation. So that the roots are going to be there, but to get more incorporation of organic matter, some level of disturbance is required. So if you take look at this equation, for a clay soil, maximum potential for carbon to be sequestered. At low disturbance, it's hard to get the carbon in. So without any disturbance of a heavy soil, it won't sequester enough carbon probably. With some disturbance, you're going to enable the organic matter to be incorporated, but when you incorporate organic matter, you're also disturbing microbial processes and they're breaking down the organic matter. So this is a dilemma. You, are, you have to dis disturb or not disturb the soil. That affects microbial activity. You want to keep carbon in, so you don't want too much disturbance to, to break down all the carbon, but you have to have some level of disturbance to get the carbon incorporated as well. And certainly to get it into to depth over time, that's also necessary. So in summary, what I'm trying to say here is it's a complex system and depending on your own soils, you, you have to work within what your own framework is. It might not be the same for somebody else. Let's quickly talk about efficient use of fertiliser. Now this is one of my pet hobby horses because if we keep focusing on chemical inputs, and I'm not saying there's a problem with chemical inputs, I'm saying how do you get the balance? So if we, I'll go through these lines one by one. So if chemical fertility is the driving force of the farming system, then the inputs, if they're not capped, except financially you can't afford to put an, um, high amounts in, then the biological processes can be overridden here. So nitrogen fixation, the, the phosphorus can wipe out the mycorrhizal benefits. Um, so you'll you're just probably not getting all the benefits if you're only driving with chemical fertility. So high yields we get, we tend to expect that the, high, the current yield is what we really want, apart from if there's a drought or whatever. So we tend to think that the yield we're getting with inputs focused on chemical fertility is the sustainable level that we really want to achieve and anything less is not a good thing. But when you focus on biological, if, biological fertility, if you emphasise that, so you're getting a balance, balance, you probably have to drop the fertiliser a bit, maybe. But you're going to cap the the um, you're going to cap the inputs because you're going to get the benefits from nitrogen fixation, the benefits from efficient use of phosphorus, benefits from the the general cycling of nutrients within the system because you're going to focus on that. But then you might say, well, that based on biological fertility, you're not getting as high a yield, and that may be the case. But my question to you is, is that the sustainable yield? So I don't think in our farming systems we've actually worked out how to get a sustainable yield because we're so used to the chemical fertility. We know so much about the responses to nutrients. We are so familiar with that. It's less easy to deal with the biological fertility in the same equation. And my question is, what is the sustainable yield in a particular situation? And how do you not maximise the biological fertility in one growing season, but over a period? 
And this is, remember I said a princ the tenth principle was time. We're used to measuring the, the output over one season. With biological fertility, it's not one season. It has to be spread over time. And the sustainability question isn't a one season question. So adding, adding these, whatever you add, you have local products that you add. There's a big interest in biochar. Now we're working on biochar too, and we're very interested, and we have a student, these are my student Narayani um, photos. She's looking at this biochar as a habitat for microorganisms, because we thought, and if you read the literature, this is a great home. Adding biochar can increase the biological fertility of soil, increase the habitat of soil. And what's really interesting is that we can find hardly any organisms on this biochar when it's in soil, even when it's incubated with organic matter, when you control the nutrient inputs. So she's focusing on looking at it when you put it into soil and what, what colonises it and how it affects microbial activity, microbial biomass in particular, but mycorrhizal fungi as well. So the questions that we asked were, how is biochar affecting soil biology? And the, quest, the answers that we're getting out is, well, it's not as straightforward as what we would read in the literature. There are a lot of generalisations here. So the question about the benefit of biochar is still out there, but the tenth principle about time is a factor here. So leaving these sort of products in soil for a longer period of time is probably necessary to get the benefits. Now, biofertilisers, what I mean here, and this is a commonly used word, is where people make up a, a, a microbes and inoculate into the field. Now, rhizobium is the classic inoculant, but there are many other inoculants that are used. Putting organisms into a field is a tricky situation because of the existing population that's in the soil. So how do you select the right inoculants to improve something to do with the farming system? Is it to get more yield, to release phosphorus from organic matter, or whatever you want these bugs that you're putting in to do? Now, the principle here that I have is that there's no one size fits all, that you need to adapt the organisms that you're introducing to the soil conditions. So there are different phases. If you're putting them in, in an early phase of a farming system, heading towards a biological system, then it's probably just something to replace fertiliser. But if you've got a more mature, healthy soil and you're introducing organisms, then they, that, the organisms you introduce need to be different because they're going into a completely different biological environment. So these can be used to enhance biological fertility, but we need to pick the right ones depending on the stage that the farming system's at. So here's an, a way that we can think about this. So remember I've said time, and time affects biology, soil management affects biology, but climate change, droughts, these things affect soil biology too. So we don't have a soil system, we have a soil system that's changing through various circumstances. So if you're going to inoculate with uh, any organism that you put into soil, you need to think what phase you're in. So is it just to replace a fertiliser, just to release nutrients? Is it to do with a bit more complex um, interaction with organisms and with the soil, so the transition phase? Or have you already got a good, in good soil that you want to enhance? And I, from a biological point of view, the organisms won't be all the same across that continuum. So just taking something as an inoculant has to be considered within this broader framework. So this is my final point. I've given you 10 principles. They seem very simplistic, but if you unpick them in your own circumstances, then they will have meaning to you. They might have a different meaning to someone else in a different land or different soil or different cropping system. But this is something here that I'm going to mention that takes, that applies across any system. So we've talked about building carbon and the complexity of building carbon, and that's mainly a nitrogen-driven process. It's nitrogen fertiliser, you know, drives plant growth in a major way. The carbon and the nitrogen are linked. 
And we're driving this system to get greater productivity, but also to retain carbon. But if you forget about the other part of the equation, and I'm saying phosphorus is the other part of the equation, because while car carbon and nitrogen are linked, phosphorus is less linked in that. Obviously, phosphorus is linked to carbon, all of these things because the, they're part of the same plant material. But often this is the focus and we use then fertiliser phosphorus as a separate um, component of the system. But if you put too much phosphorus in, then you lose the benefits from the mycorrhizal fungi. So the challenge is to get these two to work together. The challenge is to add the nitrogen so that you then know how much phosphorus to add. Currently in Western Australia, we add nitrogen and phosphorus we add according to how much we can afford. Um, but I think that the two need to be considered at the same time because plants need a certain proportion of carbon and nitrogen. These, this is well, well understood. Without considering the two, and I know that there are models now where fertilisers are all being combined in a, a, a calculator together, I think that for soil biological fertility this is essential. So you really want to maximise the biology related to nitrogen and the biology related to phosphorus and then put it all together. Because if you only take one component of it, then you'll have a system that's out of balance. So this is what I've been talking about. Can we use soil fertility, soil biological fertility to sustain agriculture? Well, my view is that this is the aim, that we should be trying to do this. But I don't think that we understand enough about managing a biological system yet to make this work. But it's always better to be at the beginning of something so we have this challenge ahead of us. I've tried to set this out in 10 principles and it's in your notes so you can run through the 10 to over the next few hours or days. But the 10 are there because but they're all different and you have to manage all of those together. It's not just managing one component of soil fertility. So there are a number of options that you can use to build biological fertility and that will depend on your own circumstances. And in Western Australia, we have the advantage because we've got pretty poor soils, we've got pretty sandy soils. We've actually had to start to think from first principles and the advantage of that has been that we can think up from a, a base and then we add organic matter, we add clay, and then the farming system sits over the top of that. And these are all influences on the biology. So we have the advantage, I think, of starting with a very simple system in, in some of our Western Australian soils, but you have very different soils here. So I'm putting the principles in front of you and the application of those principles is now up to you. So thank you very much for having me.